also uh, the, the, the courtesy and hospitality. Uh, I, I wasn't quite sure how I, I was going to get from the airport uh, last night and uh, who was waiting, awaiting me as uh, I, I got off the plane, but the State Department chairman. And I, I was honored uh, by that. I've had uh, many good friends and political allies over the years from Iowa. Uh, there have always been wonderfully conservative uh, Iowans that I worked with in college Republicans and young Republicans uh, and in the senior party. Uh, there have also been, uh, as we have in every state, uh, a, a certain free Republicans, and we have to deal with them, but my view has always been uh, that uh, I'm in politics for, uh, for important uh, principles, uh, limited government, free enterprise, strong national defense, and traditional values, and conservatives win uh, when we have an alliance of people whose priorities or one, two, three, or all four of, of those uh, uh, priorities. I've been doing political education and training for a very long time, uh, and there are a lot of graduates of my training here, and in fact, uh, your governor, uh, Terry Branstad, went to my very first national training. I knew him when he was a college Republican, and he went to my first national training school uh, uh, long ago in 1960. Eight. And, uh, and your uh, Secretary of State, uh, Matt Schultz, is also a graduate of, of, of my training, and uh, I'm very happy to, to do that. I, uh, I'm very pleased uh, uh, to uh, speak to a lot of Iowa Republicans uh, because I admire what's going on, frankly, in your state party. The left does not like what is going on, perhaps, in the Republican of Iowa, but it is being run well, and as a first principle, it's on a sound financial basis. There's no debt, and there's a substantial uh, uh, reserve in the state party, and that is not always possible uh, to be done, and I congratulate uh, A.J. and his administration for, for doing that. Um, the, um, I grew up politically in Louisiana. Now at age 73, I've had uh, opportunity for long participation in my home state of Louisiana and for the last uh, 40 years in my adopted state of Virginia. And they are very different states politically. Uh, Virginia things tend to operate at a fairly high level of decorum. And in Louisiana, the politics, at least when I was growing up, were terribly and notoriously corrupt. give you a true story about that, which will illustrate how bad things were back there in Louisiana. Um, when I became uh, 21 and could register to vote, I decided to become a Republican because I wanted to be a Barry Goldwater delegate uh, at the National Convention three and a half years later. At the time, party registration in Louisiana was 98% Democratic. Republican registration was one and a half percent, and there were no elected Republicans in the entire state, not one state legislator, not one local official. And I, I'm happy to say that the state now is dominated uh, by Republicans, every statewide office held by Republicans, Republican majorities in the, the House and, and Senate, and, uh, and things have, have really turned around in that state, but it used to be really bad. While we now have in Louisiana a fine reform governor who has uh, been successful and has been overwhelmingly reelected, uh, the corruption used to be really bad. And my favorite story of this was uh, about a sheriff's race in St. Landry Parish back in the late 1960s. There had been a sheriff there for many years in St. Landry Parish, which is in the southern part, a Cajun uh, population largely there, um, who, who had run a notoriously corrupt uh, administration.
administration and the sheriffs were uh, traditionally the most powerful political figure in these rural parishes. And the sheriff was named uh, Cap Doucet, D-O-U-C-E-T. He was challenged uh, for the Democrat nomination after decades of being sheriff by someone who described himself as a reform candidate for sheriff, and it was another Cajun named Adler Ledoux, L-E-D-O-U-X. And the challenger talked the sheriff into a live television debate on the local station. And they went after each other as Cajuns sometimes uh, do. And the challenger says to the sheriff, Cat, the good people of St. Landry Parish going to elect me their new sheriff because they're tired of the notorious corruption we got all over St. Landry Parish. The sheriff said, that's not so. I tell you, we got model law enforcement here in St. Landry Parish. Why? In fact, people come not only from across Louisiana, but from all over the United States to observe our model law enforcement. The challenger says, Cat, you know and I know and all them good people watching us at home in St. Landry Parish, they know uh, we got open prostitution all over St. Landry Parish. No, we don't. Yes, we do. No, we don't. Uh, yes, we do. Um, and uh, the sheriff swelled up and said, I tell you, we don't have that here. And the challenger said, Why, yes, we do. We got one of them places on Main Street in Opelousas. We got one of those places out on Highway 190. We got one of those places out on the Chapelai Road. We got open prostitution all over St. Landry Parish. Sheriff raised up and said, we don't got no open prostitution in St. Landry Parish. You got to be known to get in them places. <laughs> um, Conservatives um, have had a hard time coming to grips with what I believe is the real nature of politics which the left has understood for a long time. Philosophically committed conservatives tend to believe that to be right in the sense of being correct is sufficient to win. We tend to believe that if we can prove that we are right, Logically, then somehow victory will fall into our deserving hands like a ripe fruit off of a tree. That is not the real nature of politics, and the left has understood it for a long time. The real nature of politics, in my opinion, is that the winner in a political contest over time is determined by the number and the effectiveness of the activists on the respective sides. And if one side has a greater number of effective activists over time, that uh, side wins the major battles in the public policy process, which are elections and legislative battles. So um, if it is true that the winner is determined by the number and effectiveness of the activists on the respective sides, then for a side to win, that side must figure out how to significantly increase the number and effectiveness of the activists and leaders on its side. And to increase the number and the effectiveness of the activists and leaders on your side, you have to employ effective political technology, skills, techniques. And the, the study and use of philosophically neutral uh, techniques and skills are often not appealing to philosophically committed conservatives. Because after all, we know that we are right. We have the analysis of what works and what's right and best in our heads. And why should we bother studying non-philosophical techniques. That's just mere techniques. So it's hard to do that. It's hard to, for people to accept uh, that they have to study politics and have to learn how to win. And in many ways, the, the growth of the conservative uh, movement, the 
the increase of conservative influence on the Republican Party and in the nation uh, is a direct result of many conservatives figuring out this analysis that I have just given you. And if what I've said is correct, then if you're philosophically committed and somebody tells you this and you accept it, then you can also have that person accept that there is a moral obligation to study how to win. Because if the opposition knows better how to organize and communicate uh, than you do, and they implement that technology, they're going to beat you no matter how right you are. And I was a Goldwater conservative. I did get to be a Goldwater delegate in 64. I was the youngest elected delegate in the nation at age 24. Um, but most of us for Goldwater hadn't figured out the real nature of politics, and we lost badly because uh, the, the, the Lyndon Johnson and the left and the, the news media and academia, which was very left-wing even then, uh, just swamped us with a greater number of effective activists. But by the early 1970s, conservatives, many of us had figured it out, and we set about studying how to win, and we formed new organizations. We increased the membership and effectiveness and number of donors and the budgets of existing conservative organizations in a very dramatic way. Uh, for example, in 1972, the National Right to Work Committee was thought to be uh, one of the biggest and best and most powerful conservative organizations. In 1972, they had 25,000 members nationally, and they, that was impressive. But by 1979, they had increased their membership from 25,000 to 1.7 million members. And now you're talking about real numbers. And so new groups were founded. Uh, old groups were built up. Whole new categories of people were brought into the public policy process. The government had become the enemy of traditional values on many issues. Uh, and thus it was possible uh, for many theologically conservative religious leaders who had never thought that, the, that politics was any part of their calling to realize that they had sheerly for the defense of their values, which were under attack by government at various levels, uh, they got huge numbers of people involved. And by 1980, there were millions of previously inactive theologically conservative church members who had been activated in politics and we nominated and elected Ronald Reagan. So that's what's uh, going on in, uh, over the long term. And there are still new conservative organizations being founded. Uh, and many of them fail, but many of them continue for a long time and some of them grow very large and increase their effectiveness in the public policy process. Uh, now, there is uh, a lot of talk uh, that, is, that is promoted primarily through the left-wing media that somehow the conservative movement is falling apart. Uh, there are internal contradictions. There is not complete agreement. Uh, and. The, uh, the, the whole operation is going to fall apart and the left is going to be dominant for a long time. You've all heard that and read that in left-wing and mainstream uh, media. And I have to tell you that I am not greatly concerned about that. I don't think it is near the problem that our opposition would wish us to believe and they will do anything that they can to get one set of conservatives fighting against another uh, and there's a certain amount of that and, and that is inevitable even if uh, there was basic agreement on every public policy issue different people have different priorities and they would want their issues to be the, the number one priority for everybody but that's not how a, a movement uh, comes together. So there are these centrifugal forces which tend to drive elements of a coalition or a movement apart. But there is also a powerful centripetal force which brings everybody together. And I think 
the experience of several decades that indicates that that centripetal force is stronger than the centrifugal force which moves people apart. Uh, and that is that when the major battles in the public policy process are conducted, and those major battles, I said earlier, are elections and legislative battles. When those battles are being fought, it is in the interest of everybody who is conservative to work together um, to beat the left. Because whether you are primarily concerned about limited government or free, or free market or strong defense or traditional values, you have the same enemy. It's the left. They are out to destroy all of us. And in practice, what happens is, in these major decision-making points, the leadership of the various elements finding themselves uh, fighting the same foes and wanting the same result in an election or a legislative battle will gather together. And often they'll sit around at the same table and talk about how to win the same battle on the same side and are always conscious that they have the same enemy out to destroy everybody uh, who is in the room. Uh, that tends to pull people together. And when you are, particularly at the national level, leaders of such organizations meet as often as there are these major turning points of elections or uh, legislative battles, and the people who are the leaders get to know each other. They get to know each other by first name. They work together on projects. And some people take some aspects of the battle and the others take other aspects of the battle. They work together, they you begin to, uh, uh, to know each other, and then one day the head of one organization is invited to dinner again at the home of the head of some, another organization and he gets to the door and he knocks on the door, and inside the house, the dog walks up, and the dog wags its tail rather than barks. <laughs> because there is now a community of interest. And so I think that is a very powerful force. It doesn't work as well at the local level, because uh, the head of the local pro-life organization uh, may, uh, may, may change uh, or the head of the local gun club may change, and they often don't have this experience of years and years of working together and learning to trust each other and, and cooperate. But at the national level, it certainly works well, and at the local level, it in fact uh, often works uh, as well. So I think we have to understand that uh, uh, Ben Franklin was right founding of the country where he once famously observed uh, that uh, we have to hang together or most assuredly we shall hang separately. And that is a powerful influence and it's been uh, working in our country in, in a very, for a very long time. Now, A.J. mentioned to you uh, the work that I have done uh, on matters that relate to the Republican rules. I have been at that a long time. I've also been training people, uh, and I've been able to find generous donors who have contributed to my political education and training programs, and I can tell you the interest is greater uh, among conservatives and liberty-minded people uh, in studying how to win than it has ever before been. Uh, in 2012, my organization set a, uh, a, a huge uh, record, a big increase over the number that we had ever trained in any previous year, last year, we trained 11,800 people. This year, already, now we're just in early August, my Leadership Institute has trained over 10,000 people. We're going to dramatically exceed uh, our, our uh, all-time record of, of last year. People are hungry to learn, and partly, I believe, this is because people see very clearly that the country is in great danger. Things are going very badly in our country. If we continue in the way that we are going, the culture will be uh, uh, completely undermined. 
and uh, economically this country would go the way of, of Greece and Cyprus and other uh, socialist-run uh, countries elsewhere in the world. So people are motivated. Um, Dr. Samuel Johnson, the great uh, late 18th century uh, uh, intellectual, uh, once uh, pointed out that an impending hanging focuses the mind wonderfully. And I think we, we, we are uh, in a similar situation in our, in our country. Uh, we have a militant leftist president who is pretty open about that government is the solution for everything, and those in this room know it is not. Government is often the source of the problem, not the source of the solution, as Ronald Reagan pointed out so, so successfully. Uh, and he has appointed thousands of people who share his philosophy and given them power in government, and each of them uh, does not need instructions from the White House to tell them what to do. They are ideologues, and they have uh, powers and responsibilities, and they are perfectly capable of figuring out ways and means to use that power to, to advance the leftist philosophy um, and uh, nibble away more and more about what makes this country break. I've got, uh, uh, I, I see AJ is moving uh, up here. Uh, he did want me to talk about the rules battles, uh, and uh, I, I will tell you that the battles which you talked about are coming. Yes, sir. Do you want to take questions, too? Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions, and I'll try to finish off the rules stuff, and I'm going to share with you what uh, latest state of the, uh, of the rules battles. Uh, we are meeting in a couple of weeks in Boston, and I'm proposing a change in the rules um, uh, again, and I think there's a pretty good chance that this change uh, will uh, pass. I am proposing this time a one-word amendment uh, to one of the rules. It simply changes uh, what is now the word may in the rules to the word shall, which used to be in the rules before this power grab at um, uh, deluge that Ben Ginsburg subjected us to. Um, and uh, the, the problem that the party has faced for decades is the front loading of the delegation selection process. I have always been on the National Committee in favor of maintaining the position of Iowa and New Hampshire um, uh, because I, I think that it, it is appropriate for the period of the nomination process to be reasonably long to give an opportunity for testing of the candidates. If we had a, a national primary where all the delegates or most of the delegates were selected in a, on a single day or in a period of a few days, we wouldn't have the opportunity uh, to test people in a wide variety of uh, circumstances. Uh, there's also a danger in a national primary of, of having uh, it dominated by someone who, of great personal wealth. It takes a, it takes a while grassroots people to unite behind uh, a conservative choice. And if, we, if, if it all rushed up to a primary on a single day, uh, that process uh, would, I think, weaken the conservative position. And there's also a problem we have seen in a number of election cycles uh, that uh, if, if all of the results were on a single day, the liberal media could, in a sh very short period of time in the run-up to that election, um, create a celebrity and, and name identification and even some popularity of their favorite candidate, whomever their favorite non-conservative Republican uh, potential nominee uh, would be. All of those reasons are bad. And so I am proposing uh, at the convention, at, at the National Committee meeting, uh, in Boston coming up, that we restore the solution that was acquired over decades of struggle, where the requirement, the requirement was made after you have out the carve out of the original states, 
which are Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada. Um, no delegates can be selected or bound under the, under the rules before the 1st of March. Uh, but over the years, states were trying to move closer and closer to the head of the line, trying to leapfrog over each other. Um, and so a rule was adopted which said that, uh, that a state could not hold a winner-take-all primary prior to the 1st of April. That was the rule. Unfortunately, last election cycle, uh, some states broke that rule. Uh, they were penalized, but with penalties that wasn't nearly se severe enough, and that forced every uh, uh, state to consider its position and forced Iowa to move forward your caucuses, et cetera, and we had, because the process started early, we had a much longer pro process than was necessary. What Ben Ginsburg did uh, at the Tampa Convention was uh, to eliminate the requirement that if you're going to have a, a primary in March, that it has to be um, a uh, proportional allocation of delegates. You couldn't have um, winner-take-all primaries in March. And he did away with that by changing one word. Uh, he changed the word may to shall. My proposal is that we change it back in the rules from, sh um, from may uh, to shall, which I think would have a very healthy effect and, and spread out the delegate selection process to a, recent, a reasonable interval and prevent the 